as folklorists, we take tradition and superstition seriously. It's fun to talk about how to protect yourself from vampires or how to kill a vampire by staking it through the heart, and we're definitely going to do that in this episode. But we're also going to talk about the larger context for these practices and how they developed in the first place. In Dracula, when Van Helsing rallies the band of vampire hunters together, he tells them all that all we have to go upon are traditions and superstitions. These do not at the first appear much, when the matter is one of life and death, nay of more than either life or death. Yet must we be satisfied? In the first place, because we have to be, no other means is at our control. And secondly, because after all, these things, tradition and superstition, are everything. Even in the face of scientific innovation, Van Helsing asks his friends to treat superstition and folk belief as a vault of knowledge, as a parallel way of seeing the world that he hopes will allow them to defeat Dracula. Folk beliefs are unofficial beliefs that develop and operate outside powerful social structures. As scholar David Hufford points out, most academic theories have assumed that folk belief is false, or at least unfounded, non-rational, and non-empirical. But the thing is, these beliefs can tell us a lot about how people experience and make sense of the world. Beliefs don't just appear out of thin air, out of context. They appear because of a reason. As Hufford adds, much folk belief is reasonable that it is rationally developed from experience. That is to say, the reasoning involved in many such beliefs utilizes methods of inference based on observations which are commonly accepted as valid. Hufford's groundbreaking theory argues that many supernatural beliefs are rooted in reasonable, logical attempts to try and make sense of real bodily or cultural experiences. Now, Hufford is not arguing that these beliefs are necessarily 100% true. And neither are we. And neither are we, but rather that they're often rooted in observations and inference rather than neurotic defenses or overwhelming biases or wild flights of fancy. If we apply Hufford's theory to vampires, then we can see how folk beliefs about them are not wholly irrational, nor are they ridiculous in their context. With that in mind, we're going to take a close look at some of the superstitions and strategies invented over the years with the hope of protecting oneself from vampires and also perhaps containing and killing vampires in order to reveal what believers may have been thinking and experiencing. As we do this, as we go through all of these strategies, it's important to keep in mind that Bram Stoker's construction of vampire lore for the novel Dracula itself is, in the words of leading Dracula scholar Elizabeth Miller, more haphazard than scholarly. Now, she doesn't mean this as an insult. After all, Stoker was not writing a historical treatise or a practical manual detailing how to kill a vampire. That's not what he was doing. He was writing a work of fiction. He was writing a novel. But Stoker drew on whatever supernatural lore or literature he could find, and when he couldn't find it, he'd just make it up. He pulled from authors we've discussed like John Polidori, Sheridan Le Fanu, and others. He pulled bits and pieces from vampire folklore. He pulled things from werewolf folklore. He pulled a lot of things from werewolf folklore. Yeah, a lot of things, surprising number of things. <laughs> All of these different sources are fair game for talking about vampires today, though, because so much of what Stoker put together all of these bits and pieces that he combined in order to create his vampire have solidified into the version of the vampire that we now know and that we expect. This means that in Dracula, and in most vampire literature, film, and other more contemporary media, we're not seeing pure replications of actual folk beliefs held by real people. That's not what we're seeing. Instead, we're seeing a kaleidoscope made up of historical facts, folk beliefs transported across culture and language, and literary invention. It's often impossible to pick these elements apart cleanly, but that doesn't mean this avenue is fruitless. Instead, it means that we often learn more about the time in which a vampire story is told or written than the earlier eras that they often describe. Let's begin by looking at one of the classic defenses against vampires, garlic. The scent is meant to repel vampires and keep them away from your person and even your home. 
In Dracula, Van Helsing drapes a garland of garlic around Lucy's neck and fills her room with garlic blooms, which, by the way, are purple and look a little bit like thistles. They're pretty. They're, yeah, they're pretty. The superstition does predate Stoker's Dracula. Garlic as a vampire repellent is mentioned in one of Dracula's confirmed sources, Emily Gerard's 1885 article about Transylvanian superstitions. Interestingly, in some cultures, it's the existence of a strong smell generally, not the actual substance of garlic in particular, that's the problem. In old Yugoslavia, the area now known as Serbia and Montenegro, for example, Garlic was one of the things that could be used, but cow dung and anything else especially pungent were also very effective. Across cultures, vampires collectively seem to just hate strong smells. As someone with an overly sensitive nose, I'm actually pretty sympathetic. <laughs> but there's more to garlic's efficacy than its pungency. Garlic has a history of being used to ward off evil spirits generally. In folklore, its protective effects aren't specific to just vampires. Exactly. However, culturally, we definitely associate garlic strongly with vampires, right? At least nowadays. The protective properties of garlic against vampires are so well known and expected that it's frequently depicted as a kind of punchline in contemporary vampire media. Vampires in books or on TV joke about how much they love garlic bread or pretend to faint when garlic is brandished at them. It's it works as a something funny. But we, even when it is a joke, the joke works because of the strength of the convention. We all know that vampires are supposed to hate garlic, which is what makes the joke work. That said, early reviews of Stoker's Dracula often commented that the vampiric fear of garlic was funny for the opposite reason. It wasn't yet a cliche, so to some late Victorians, powerful, blood-sucking monsters fearing a seasoning broke their suspension of disbelief. However, in folklore globally, plants and herbs have all kinds of powers, and these beliefs are often rooted in observation and experience. Very specific cultural literacy determined whether this plant lore is understood as a cliché, a joke, or just good common sense. Perhaps the only vampire repellent as well known as garlic is the cross. This might take the form of wearing a cross on a necklace or a ring, or of carrying a cross to use as a weapon of intimidation. This is perhaps most famously depicted in the 1931 Dracula film, when Van Helsing iconically brandishes a cross at Bela Lugosi. While well, the idea of brandishing a cross as a weapon is largely a literary invention, all these uses of crosses are part of a much larger pattern of invoking spiritual objects and symbols to ward off evil spirits. Because American and European culture is dominantly Christian, there's often an assumption that Christian symbols are the necessary tools for the job, especially because the supernatural is often presented as anti-Christian and therefore of the devil. This chain of logic is why so many creatures from folklore have aversions to anything associated with Christianity. This, of course, covers vampires, but it also extends to fairies, werewolves, and all kinds of other supernatural creatures. In other parts of the world, and even occasionally in American and British vampire stories, sacred symbols from other faiths are deployed instead, like I've seen a Star of David used a couple times, for example. But this strong association between the devil, or at least evil, and vampires means that often crosses, or swords deliberately shaped like crosses, rosaries, holy water, sometimes even lambs and crossroads, are all things that can commonly be used against vampires. This association between religion and protection also helps us make sense of why funeral rites could take on so much weight when fears of vampires were strong. Historian Paul Barber describes widespread European folk beliefs intersecting with burial practices in order to prevent vampirism. For example, the lack of a proper burial might result in an otherwise innocent body rising again as a vampire. By practicing proper funeral rites, it was believed you could prevent this from happening. This leads us up to the idea of containment, that with the right tools, you could prevent vampires from rising from their coffins at all. Certain kinds of deaths were sometimes thought to increase the likelihood of vampirism, 
in Christian contexts, this might mean people who committed suicide, were non-Christian, hadn't been baptized, or hadn't been given a proper burial. Because these people were considered especially susceptible to vampirism, extra precautions were sometimes taken. Yeah, and some common methods to prevent new vampires from rising might include placing objects in the grave, things like coins or garlic or candles or seeds to count. We see evidence for this practice in Germany, but also globally in places like Canada and Macedonia. The idea was that the vampire would become too preoccupied with counting these objects to rise from their coffin and do any real harm. Folklorists have literally described this as harnessing the vampire's compulsions. It's a fascinating humanization of the vampire. And if a vampire is a bit human, then perhaps it can be trapped and outsmarted by humans. Likewise, it was thought that if you threw a bunch of little objects into a vampire's path, think like a handful of rice, the vampire would have to stop and count them all, sometimes only at the pace of one a year. Could this be how we got the count, like from Sesame Street? I mean, the folklore definitely mirrors the characterization. So putting knots in a coffin with a suspected vampire's body was another good distraction method commonly used in northern Germany in particular. Apparently, vampires just can't resist a really good knot. They'll stay in their coffins picking at it forever, which was said to prevent them from rising as well. If you suspected someone had a chance of turning into a vampire after death, this was one way you could at least prevent them from coming out of their grave. <laughs> so a modern equivalent of this might be putting like a bunch of crossword puzzles or like the Wordle archive into <laughs> a vampire's grave. And Essentially, yeah. <laughs> basically, so this belief in the distractibility of vampires and their irresistible compulsions, not only for bloodlust, but for counting and puzzle solving, humanizes them. They might still be monsters, but they're imperfect monsters with their own foibles. So perhaps they can be beaten by imperfect humans. Seems logical. No. Yeah. Additionally, people sometimes put sharp objects into graves to prevent vampires from rising. And there are even some places, like Poland, where they say that all you have to do is bury a suspected vampire just like face down, sometimes with the additional precaution of stones over their heads, and because this will stop them from standing up. Yeah. Other methods of preventing walking included tying the feet of the corpse together in Romania and wrapping the corpse in a carpet in Bulgaria. Many cultures also suggest taking newly dead corpses out of the family home in unconventional ways, like through a window or even a hole made in the side of the house. Once the body was out, it would then be taken to the burial ground very circuitously, so that if the body rose as a vampire later, it would be confused and not know where they were or how to get back to their former home. While this wouldn't prevent the corpse from rising as a vampire, at least it wouldn't be able to harm its still human family. Another strategy of containment is planting particular vegetation over the graves. Roses, with their thorns, were a well-known containment strategy that was used in Dracula. But any plants with thorns that forced vampires to like basically rise up straight into built-in barbed wire, any of that would work. This also seems to connect back to the practice of putting sharp objects into coffins. In Romania, there is even evidence of an automatic vampire piercing device, as Barber puts it. Essentially, the coffin lid would be shut, the body would be buried, and then several sharp stakes would be driven into the grave so that if the body seeks to rise up out of the coffin, it will immediately be punctured by one of these stakes and killed. Pre-staking a corpse was also very common, but more on staking in a moment. Of course, stories about vampires are not limited to protection and containment. Often, the most satisfying stories about vampires involve that vampire being slain. If the vampire is destroyed, it's no longer a threat, and the story is affirming and victorious and not just cautionary or frightening. Stories about slaying vampires often involve trying to find the monsters while they're most vulnerable, while they're sleeping. Vampires are usually nocturnal, so they sleep during the day, often in coffins containing their native soil. Spotting a coffin in a place it shouldn't be or finding evidence of a recently disturbed grave is often a big giveaway of vampiric presence. Tampering with a vampire's native soil can be an effective strategy because it weakens their power by weakening their connection to their homeland, 
at least according to Dracula. To the best of our knowledge, this is Stoker's own contribution to vampire lore, but it has been used to great effect since then, too. Yes. So, for example, <laughs> there's a hilarious episode in season three of the TV show What We Do in the Shadows, where the vampires lose their coffin earth during this trip to Atlantic City because housekeeping comes into their room and throws it all away. It's literally a pile of dirt. Yeah, so <laughs> housekeeping's like, well, I mean, We're nah. cleaning up their hotel room. And the vampires come back and they're like, oh, oh no. no. <laughs> so this means that the vampires are unable to sleep, leading to just escalating delirium. And finally, in desperation, they send their familiar, who's a human helper, to all of their homelands to collect new samples of native soil for them so that they can, you know, sleep and function. <laughs> In Dracula, after the destruction of the vampire's coffins and homeland Earth, the primary way for tracking the Count is actually through his psychic connection to Mina. This is an especially troubling tool because while it exploits Dracula's vulnerability, it also exploits Mina's. This connection elicits sympathy, sways emotions, and can even be an avenue of transformative power. The fact that the vampire hunters basically use Mina like a dowsing rod to find Dracula reinforces her connection to the supernatural, which is extremely dangerous because it further erodes the boundary between the human and the vampiric. It's ultimately effective, but the cost is that in order to destroy the monster, Mina has to invite the monstrous into her own mind. So once the monster has been found, how do you kill it? Sometimes the method is surprisingly mundane, or at least not attuned to the supernatural. Stoker's Count Dracula is slain by having his throat sheared through and being stabbed in the heart, which is, you know, gruesome, but also a perfectly effective way of killing a human. Pretty sure that would kill anybody. <laughs> Pretty sure. But because supernatural strength and healing properties are often tied up with conceptions of vampirism, many methods of killing them have to be very specific in order to be effective. The most popular and widespread method for killing vampires is staking them through the heart. Most famous vampire hunters, like Buffy from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the TV show, use them. To be fair, this would kill a normal human too. Yep. <laughs> you know, if you ram a giant piece of wood through someone's heart, you know, they're not gonna walk away from not that. Not necessarily. <laughs> but there's a magical quality to staking as well. In some stories, what the stakes are made of, their composition, makes all the difference. In the Baltic area, for example, tradition states that the appropriate wood to make a stake is ash. In Serbia, it's hawthorn. Recall that while Stoker's Dracula is killed with knives, other vampires within the novel, like Lucy, are staked. This method of killing vampires is definitely mentioned in Emily Gerard's article about Transylvanian superstitions, and it's also present in other vampire literature that predated Dracula, like Farney the Vampire and Carmilla. Stoker was definitely familiar with the idea that staking vampires is an effective way to kill them. This trope continues till the modern day. We've mentioned Buffy already, but it, it remains one of the most common ways to kill vampires across all kinds of media. In the 2013 film, Only Lovers Left Alive, which we adore beyond reason. Exactly. <laughs> staking is reimagined when the protagonist, Adam, a vampire who is suffering from depression, considers committing suicide using a gun loaded with a wooden bullet. He asks that the bullet be made from the hardest and most dense wood and suggests things like ironwood, snakewood, or African blackwood. While a regular bullet won't kill him, it seems that he could essentially stake himself with a particularly hard, heart-piercing wooden bullet. In this way, staking is updated and made more frightening in context by involving a more modern weapon that is implicated in the vast majority of suicides among men in the U.S. Another traditional way to kill vampires is decapitation. This method appears in the folklore of German and Western Slavic people. This is one of the things that happens to Dracula, at least how we interpret it. His throat is cut and he's also knifed in his heart. Stoker, writing as Mina in her journal, describes it this way. On the instant came the sweep and flash of Jonathan's great knife. I shrieked as I saw it shear through the throat, whilst at the same moment, Mr. Morris's bowie knife plunged into the heart. It was like a miracle, but before our very eyes and almost in the drawing of a breath, the whole body crumbled into dust and passed from our sight. 
sheer through the throat definitely seems to imply a decapitation. Spades were actually often the particular weapon of choice for this, though, particularly spades owned by religious people like sextons, the people who would look after churches and churchyards. That seems like a particularly brutal way to decapitate someone. But it does. <laughs> Sometimes, because of the vampire's ability to heal themselves, grave dirt would be placed between the severed head and the rest of the body to ensure that they wouldn't reattach, letting the vampire come back to life. People would also sometimes place the decapitated head at the feet of the vampire, so he couldn't reach it and therefore wouldn't be able to heal. If you slice the head off, but you know, don't do something to prevent it from reconnecting to the body, there is this fear that the head and the body could maybe reattach and come back together. This brings us to our first inherently magical mode of vampire destruction, which is, of course, sunlight. Aversion to sunlight has become one of the most famous and recognizable vampire tropes. Interestingly, Dracula himself isn't actually harmed by the sun in the book. Again, he's killed with knives. It's also worth noting that even though Dracula isn't harmed by sunlight, he is heavily impacted by the cycle of day and night. There are times, notably at dusk and dawn, when Dracula is able to become more active or have more influence. Daylight is still significant in Stoker's Dracula, even if it isn't deadly. We actually have a theory about this. We think that because Stoker was reading a lot about werewolves and werewolf folklore when he was writing Dracula, that there might have been some slippage between the categories of vampire and werewolf. This was pretty common pre-20th century, as we've mentioned before. Werewolves are notoriously vulnerable to the moon and to patterns of day and night. So it makes sense, if Stoker was reading a lot of werewolf folklore, that the patterns of day and night took on significance in the novel that he was writing. If Dracula isn't killed by sunlight, so why do we now almost always assume that sunlight kills vampires? There are a few exceptions, of course, like Twilight Springs to Mind, where the sun doesn't destroy vampires, it only makes them sparkle. <laughs> which is honestly kind of an amazing twist on this whole sunlight thing. Yeah, I mean, having vampires sparkle in the sun really is kind of a clever adaptation of conventional vampire tropes. It's a twist on one of the most expected characteristics of vampires. And they still have a vulnerability to sunlight because they can't go out into it without revealing their supernatural status, without getting their covers blown. It's just glittering instead of death. And is making vampires glitter in sunlight really that much stranger than having them be terribly adverse to garlic? I don't really think so. No. Vampires don't die when exposed to sunlight in any pre-Dracula literature that we know of. They are staked or they're decapitated generally. On occasion, they even throw themselves into volcanoes. I did that too. But that said, burning generally is pretty much universally understood as one of the chief ways to kill a vampire for good, usually via cremating the corpse. To the best of our knowledge, sunlight really became the thing that kills vampires in the 1922 German film Nosferatu, in which the vampire perishes after losing himself in bloodlust and totally losing track of time. This seems to be the point where the fatality of sunlight really captured the public's imagination. It's possible that this is because it was the first time that most people were seeing a vampire on screen. This death has a dramatic visual impact. After Nosferatu, it quickly became a convention that vampires die in sunlight, just as it's expected that they drink blood. The methods of protection from vampires and destruction of vampires that we've discussed in this episode are not all directly pulled from folklore, nor are all the methods outlined by Van Helsing himself in the novel Dracula, but they're all now part of the lore around vampires the vulnerabilities we expect, the rules by which we know how to tell or deconstruct a vampire story. Some of these conventions may seem strange, even kind of silly to you, but for the people that believed them, the ideas that did come from folk belief anyway, these strategies were very real, even rational in a way. Learning about these folk beliefs teaches us what people at different times over the course of history were afraid of, and what they did to prevent their fears from coming true. They're afraid that vampires will rise up and walk the earth again, so they literally stake them down into the earth. They're afraid of vampires being agents of hell, so they use crosses against them 
Cutting off a vampire's head means that it literally cannot bite you. All of these beliefs are reasonable based on the knowledge available at the time, and that's part of why belief is so powerful.